one. Hello everyone, another week with Open Security Mini Summits. This is March 2021 and we have Sarah here with us today. We will be talking about cross-border transfers, data transfers and how to do a quick risk triage about your transfers and how to take action. I will hand it over to Sarah to let us um, tell us about herself uh, and a quick uh, background of what SHREMS is, because if you're not very familiar with SHREMS too, um, that will be a good uh, quick summary and then uh, we'll go through her slides. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's great to be here. Um, I am a data protection and cybersecurity governance risk and compliance specialist. So I started in cybersecurity and ended up in data protection. So SHREMS 2 and everything that's happened since is quite big events in my sad governance world. Um, some would say sad. Um, and I come particularly to the Open Security Summit because there were previous sessions looking at how to technically um, tackle some of the reasons why we were being told we couldn't transfer data to the US anymore. You know, could, could we only decrypt in places that were deemed to be, say, uh, an equivalent of a digital embassy, for instance, but uh, I get to tackle the less um, fun parts of this, which is how do we come to the board that we're doing the right things first? Uh, and how do we manage the risks in, in the meantime? So um, I think this probably represents where we all felt we were until there was a little bit more clarity um, about SHREMS 2. Um, we were essentially being told by our um, supervisory authorities that we needed to fix it. We needed to stop processing or um, somehow make what they had deemed an inadequate right to redress for potential surveillance overreach in the United States. We needed to make that okay somehow. I'm not quite sure how they expected us to do that. And I'm still not quite sure, um, but there are mitigations. There's been more clarity about mitigation since then. But until that clarity arrived, which in some cases has, has still just left glaring questions, um, we need to really get our arms around what our priorities are. Um, if we take a list of international transfers, including sub-processes um, like AWS and Azure sitting underneath whatever else we do, who are headquarters in the US, and we start at the top of the list and try and work downwards with an in-depth assessment, we're, we're going to kill ourselves. We just don't have enough staff. So this is, this is where I'm coming from. And in the spirit of really setting the scene, this is just a one slide summary, and my one slide summary of, of what SHREMS is, and why I'm here, which is- uh, Do you want to share your screen? Oh, gosh, yeah, that would help, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, oh, I'm success in it. <laughs> Thank you. I'm really, really doing well. Yeah, what is this? I'm, I've gone presenter mode with um, PowerPoints. So what it's done is it's hidden. It hid the, um, the Zoom screen. So let me just get that sorted out. Oh, my goodness. So, oh, and now my mouse has disappeared. So slight glitch there. I thought I was presenting, I'm not. And um, this is my one page summary of um, the reasons why we're here. Uh, Max Schrems came after Facebook again, after his um, complaint to about that took down Safe Harbor, calling our controls in Safe Harbor inadequate. And then he targeted standard contractual clauses as a, as a control to try and ensure the right thing was done stateside and said, how could they be adequate if um, Safe Harbor wasn't enough? And then Privacy Shield followed on, got laid over the top of this in the interim. And by the time the case was um, publish published in, um, was, it was finalized with the EU Court of Justice, um, there was no more Privacy Shield and the validity of standard contractual clauses has been called into question. So we have a situation where we don't have a reliable 100% lawful basis to um, transfer European personal data to the states if we are subject to what's being deemed potential overreach under um, Pfizer 702 
and the executive order one two triple three there's also the cloud act in the mix and other other legal instruments um and so what we're trying to do is we're trying to understand for individual transfers if we haven't already ceased them what contractual procedural and technical controls will help us but we don't actually have hours in the day and people oftentimes to do that kind of deep dive on every single transfer that we're doing so this is about prioritizing within lists of transfers and doing that quickly in a way that we can democratize a way that we can get the business to help us with because we don't if we don't have enough specialist hours in the day to do a deep dive for risk we probably also don't have enough specialist hours in the day to chase down somebody who knows about that transfer and ask a bunch of scoping questions too so i quickly pivoted to well what are my scoping questions what puts it in or out of scope what are my killer questions well if it's not processing eu residents data and it's not happening in a third country it's not in scope but when it is in scope there are prioritization triggers that we've been given. We've been given levers to prioritize. Um, if it hasn't got a valid, what we call Article 46 tool, GDPR Article 46 gives us the list of things that we can use as a basis for an international cross-border transfer to a, to a third country. One of those is the standard contractual clauses. Another one is um, binding corporate rules. There's life and death situations can allow you to do that. There's legitimate interest, there's legal requirements can allow you to do that. Um, but if you haven't got something that's that's appropriate any longer because um, there isn't essential equivalent control in the country you're trying to send it to, then you're going to have to sort that out. Um, derogations is another one. There's so much terminology here. A derogation is mm -hmm. essentially just an exception. If it's if you've based it on a needs must situation, one of those examples is if you were buying a house in the states, you'd want to exchange your personal data to get that deal signed. It would be a one-off time boundary thing. If you had a court case that had somebody in the, in the States implicated, or you had a big deal you were doing as a supplier that was a one-off, you may need to transfer personal data to get that done. It doesn't, it's not, those derogations are not deemed to be suitable to have regular um, bulk transfers all the time. And then there was also indications in the supplementary measures information provided to us in the essential equivalence guidance, um, that if it was large scale complex and there was sensitive data, it was also a priority. So what we're trying to do with these things is trying to eke out quick, simple questions we can ask of everybody to put these things in scope. Now, just a quick note about adequacy, just um, a third country is a country that doesn't have a predefined adequacy agreement. And this is just a for reference list of those Countries, South Korea is on the way. The UK, we hope, should, should be coming through soon. I'm not sure we deserve it, but we may well be getting it, at least for now, with a, um, with a caveat it will be um, assessed again in four years' time. And that leads me on to, well, what are my inputs? What am I actually assessing? And what's then supposed to happen? The highlighted parts are really the parts I feel we've all focused upon. Um, the inputs are the things that are proving quite hard to gather for most people. Article 30 of the GDPR requires you to have a list of the processes that you, per the, the purpose that, that you process data for. Um, most people have got something that resembles that. If it's EU personal data, you should have this record of processing activity already. And it should include your third parties and where they are processing. So you should be able to pull out a list of transfers that are, that are in scope straight away. If you haven't got that, you have a pre-scoping activity that you're going to need to do. You're also going to need to have the contracts that go with those things because you need to understand what lawful basis in the contract is currently based upon. And you're gonna to wanna to understand some context around um, controls. Privacy notices will help if you haven't got contracts and you want to understand whether it's still lawful and agreed, potentially if it's based on consent. You're going to want to understand sub processes too. And you're going to need to understand this picture of equivalence in importing countries. Um, when you're assessing, you need to understand what controls you have, what contractual controls you have, and how that balances against the risks in the country you're, you're trying to control transfer to. Now, 
I don't think it's remotely reasonable for um, many businesses unless they have a speciality in geopolitical politics or in global privacy law to um, a national security perspective to, to have in-house the decent view of every country they transfer to in terms of the, their um, risks to human rights, their data protection controls, um, and their overall essential equivalence. That's the term we look at for essential equivalence of protections. Is it the same level as in Europe? So you have to not only know that stuff, but then make a judgment over whether it's equivalent. Places like Data Guidance, the repository for news and updates and guidance around data protection from one trust, um, you know, other vendors are available, but they, they do have a heat map that shows you across a, a few different fronts um, how risky or not individual countries are. And that can be used as a baseline for this, for this metric. But if not, you're gonna to need to engage a law firm when you know the range of countries that you, you're interested in, someone that can give you this perspective. We would not expect to, to have this in-house. Um, and after that point, you're gonna to have to make some changes. If changes are possible, otherwise you're going to have to cease processing or relocate processing. Now, there are, there are a variety of different views about people who may be subject to that, for the US, to that executive order um, or to the Pfizer warrants. Now, uh, Sidley Austin, um, Mr. Rawl did a, a very good article that was exploring some of the threat that was listed in the finding for Schrems 2. I've included a link to his article if somebody wants to look at that to make their own assessment of, of potential risk. But looking at all this, there is an en enormous amount of specialist digging necessary to do to get to the bottom of all these things. And there's a fair amount of technical investigation necessary to try and see if there are adequate controls in place, both between the contract and, and technically for transfers. Um, that stuff doesn't scale. I mean, not least this, do we have that list? We need to be able to find that list. If we haven't got that list, we need to ask some questions and find it out. And if we have got that list, it's just a list of systems where we don't have the context of the personal data in those systems or the context of the vendors. Um, really, we're wondering which part of the risk can we manage? If you don't have a list of in-scope transfers, you've got to find one. Once you've got an in-scope list of transfers, um, you're going to have to ask the right questions to decide whether they stay in scope and then to work out a priority for assessment. If you only have a few different transfers, you're probably all over this, you're probably done. That's fine. But a lot of businesses have far more than they expect to have. And if they can't, are not going to finish them for a while, if they're not going to finish both assessment and remediation of risk and making a decision about continuing to transfer, pausing transfer, changing contracts, changing controls, then they're going to need to prioritise some effort. And that comes down to the more general risk management catch 22, which is if you can't prioritize, then how do you scale that effort? Um, and if you need to prioritize, you need to go out and ask some questions. But if you haven't got time to go out and ask the questions, how do you prioritize? What this comes down to is that traditional ways of tackling this, perhaps sending a questionnaire with a threshold assessment attached, some kind of triage approach attached, that can, that can work quite well. But the risk is that when you fire a whole bunch of questions at people, you start to ask about controls immediately after you've asked threshold questions, you're probably speaking to two different audiences with one piece of paper or one online questionnaire. And they're not going to be able to answer those questions. You're going to stall immediately because they're going to need you to engage with them to support them to answer those questions. Um, if you're not sending any threshold questionnaire, you're just sending out questionnaires to say the vendors um, to ask them about their compliance. Uh, the lead time to get the answers back, the chasing that's required is, is probably going to be prohibitively long. So my proposals all hinge upon asking your first questions to work out whether something is in scope or not to defensively de-scope as an absolute priority just get rid of the things where none of this effort is needed and secondarily drive out those things which are low risk so they can be deferred 
and then drive out those things where you need a bit of specialist input to decide whether a, a medium risk entity or transfer might actually need the full assessment or not, or whether that can be deferred as well. And then serving up at least a core of essential information to the specialists so they can spend their time more, um, more appropriately. Because when we scratch the surface of a lot of the risk management we currently do, we're asking people, oh, well, you know, are we, okay, we know it's in scope, but is it, is it high risk? You know, let's estimate percentage probability and dollars impact. Um, how, on what basis? I, I don't ascribe to the fact that for these kind of operational purposes, more traditional risk management is, is particularly useful. So what I always propose we do is we circle back to the kind of conversations that we always have with stakeholders. We always say, you know, was it a lot of data? Was it very sensitive? Is it a high required uptime? These are, these are concepts. People understand concepts. They don't understand numbers. If you're asking them about dollars impact, you're not gonna get the same answer from people twice. So it's back to these things we drove out. Those are, in essence, risk indicators. These are things that we can potentially add a knowable standard answer to and get answered quite quickly by people. We have a question in the chat. Um, when we talk about the risk, are we talking about risk of breach or is it risk of being uh, in violation? That's a really good question. When I'm talking about risk in this context, it's really both things. I'm talking about inherent risk, but I know that has lots of definitions too. So I'm talking about inherent risk in the concept of things about the process or the processing, the nature of processing location that predispose you to more potential risk down the line, more potential risk of being um, breached because you're non-compliant, being fined because you're non-compliant, even perhaps if you don't have a breach, perhaps down the line being complained about, somebody getting hold of one of Max Schrems, none of your business questionnaires and getting it submitted to you as a company. It's not um, at the moment really concerned so much with probability. What it's concerned with is, um, are we doing uh, some processing which is guaranteed to, to put us at more risk than our other transfers of those kind of things happening? It's scaling in the population, it's triaging within your in-scope population which ones put me at most risk? So which ones do I need to drill down to get that kind of more traditional residual risk picture? And you get that more traditional residual risk picture by engaging to do an in-depth assessment. This is, this is prioritizing getting to that next step for you and getting to that next step with a whole bunch of the information that it's a pain, basic information it's a pain to gather generally. And where would the um, risk to the subjects be? Would it be another risk assessment that has already fed into this um, processing um, list or is it how, how would you say yeah I mean the risk of the data subjects is a function of how much data that you're um, transferring or how much data you're permitting access to as part of of this an individual assessment that you're you're doing this triage on um, there are things that we know as professionals predispose data subjects to more risk. If it's, if it's more of their data, if it's more sensitive data, if it's going to lots of third parties, if it's going to lots of different third countries, these are the things we're driving out right now. So the actual amount of risk to an individual data subject will be a function of the next phase to drive out. Should I go on? Cool. Um, I mean, this, this view is really just respecting the fact that there's no point asking a question if we have to wait until contracts are signed. So this is about trying to turn off the tap on new transfers and also about the questions you ask at the right stage of trying to get through your pre-existing transfers. Um, you have those gating questions that you, you don't do anything else until you sample in the ones you left out of scope at some point in the future. You don't do anything else if they're not EU residence data, if it's not EU residence data and it's not 
going to a third country or being access, accessed from a third country. Um, then you have what I term here absolute and conditional criteria, which I'll talk more about in a moment, um, which are the no brainers for engagement, the no brainers for really kicking the tires for getting lots of specialists involved. Um, conditional criteria, which is prioritizing within the population. So this is a no brainer, but what level of potential risk is it? And the best next steps might be, as we said, to put it on one side or to do it a little bit later or to refer it to a specialist team for a technical assessment or a vulnerability test or a contract review or a DPIA, or perhaps it's something agile and very high risk, you actually wanna plug someone in and, and get them working with the team who's dealing with that transfer. And then it's the, to the more traditional activity, which is taking whichever control set that you would be used to, uh, to assessing based on the technologies and the, uh, change, the nature of the change, and then planning to remediate. So this is really just putting those risk indicators that we got into a little bit more shape. We've got contract vendor and location related in indicators. The ones highlighted yellow, I've highlighted them yellow because they're ones that you probably do need some specialists to answer. They probably aren't great candidates for your first 15 minute questionnaire, unless you're specifically aiming the questions at the procurement team and the legal team, and potentially they can get those answers quickly from the vendors. The other things are, are good candidates for things that are knowable early and knowable by lay people who have some familiarity with what that transfer is intended to do. The things on the other side, the data processing indicators are more traditional things that we look at to scale potential risk to data subjects. And this is what it's intended to be. It's intended to be a very simple, quick, straightforward, plain English, abstraction layer to gather information very quickly, usually in the form of a survey, usually in the form of a branched survey. So you're only asking questions that are relevant to the people who are asking, answering them. Now, I understand for people here who may be thinking about trying to slot this into a software development process, this, is, this, isn't, going to, this isn't going to read properly. Um, there's a different approach to that that I can talk about in, in a moment. But in terms of triaging amongst a pre-existing population of transfers, if you're trying to surface information quickly and you need to get everybody involved in doing that because you don't have enough specialist hours in your day, this is the only way I've seen work. Um, if you have a spreadsheet that starts asking is that a nice to know, have rather than you need to know, then you're going to, your rate of return will decrease at, at the same rate you are, um, add questions. Um, you weight the answers behind the scenes. You don't ask anything unless it can ha either have a binary answer or a multiple choice standardized response or a threshold response. So these things can be analyzed. Um, these things where it would have a threshold response or perhaps you tick boxes to say there are a specific number of risky types of processing as defined by the European Data Protection Board would then have a weighting attached to them. If it's two or more high risk processing activities as defined by the European Data Protection Board, then it puts it into a high risk category. Then you count up how many risk indicators are at which level of risk to produce a score for this. Now, the thing I want to make very clear here, I'm not proposing a scoring system that is meant to be authoritative. I am proposing a way of adding up risk indicators that is drillable so you can justify precisely why you allocated that score because it doesn't have to be perfect all it has to do is give you something that enables you to scale and prioritize within a population of transfers then once you've sent some transfers through where you've got a really good handle actually on what it involves if it spits one out that gets a risk rating or a risk indication that is way off, you really it doesn't make sense to you why that it's come out as a medium when it should be a very high. You either make a discretionary adjustment to that individual transfer uh, risk indicator or you tune and you change the thresholds for risk in your risk indicators behind the scenes. 
every but this isn't rocket science as i said i'm not pretending it is this is just trying to put some standardized shape around some common sense we all do this every time we get some new requirement whether it's pci dss whether it's shrimps 2 whether it's back when it was gdpr whether it's one of the new um, american privacy state privacy rules we will look at the criteria they have laid down to put something in scope then we will try and find the last list we did we will try and find the risk indicators that we used for the GDPR or for Schrems, see if they're fit for purpose for finding the things we need to change this time. What this is about is about standardizing it and making it repeatable and storing it for next time, making it so you can add another indicator in future, making so you can change a threshold if a new law requires it something to be considered more risky for the sake of another regulation. What do you think about adding more quantitative uh, questions like the volume Kerry was uh, commenting here. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I'm, I'm going to come on to that in a moment. I think we have to be honest about the data available to quantify risk related to things like quantities of data. Um, we don't have a go to place where those metrics for relative risk exist in a way that we can be relied upon right now. If they did, then a supervisory authority would have had the guts to put a line in the sand for how many records is high risk. And there used to be a kind of nominal behind the scenes, not quite saying it, but we thought 10,000 records was a reasonable threshold with the old Data Protection Act 1998 in the UK. But any semblance of there, there's absolutely no indication that anybody in a supervisory authority will put their name to saying how much is high versus low risk which is why they've given us types of um, risky processing as benchmarks. But I, do, I really don't think we should hold back from putting our own thresholds on this based on our own expertise and our own risk environments, because the worst that can happen is it spuriously descopes something. You get false negatives for something that should be high risk and is not. You sample within your descope population and you put it back in scope. That's the worst that happens. That feedback loop then tunes your thresholds for next time. Also, what it also does is if you're storing the justification for these scoping decisions, perhaps there was a breach or perhaps there was a price list for data from the dark market or perhaps data brokers decided to be open about how much they're paying for this kind of record versus that kind of record with these data fields or those data fields, you can tune these indicators as the world of tail data and metrics matures. But at least you've got somewhere to put that at least you've got a story to tell. At least you've got some kind of record of your journey towards maturity. I mean, this, this again, this is, this is one way of deciding on thresholds for what gives an overall um, relative rating of one type or another to an individual transfer. It's taking the output of all of those different risk indicators across the location and vendor view and the processing view, and, and simply saying if it's mostly high it's in this field if it's mostly medium in this field this is this is done through um i've managed to make one of the grc systems behave to do this for me I, of course i can do it in a cell i've also tried to build it in sharepoint um but it, it, it's it's not rocket science and it does give you a defensible starting position for the next time or why you haven't done a particular piece of work I mean, this is what you'll be more familiar with as a risk matrix, looking through these various different lenses um, and adding that probability view. I mean, this is this is ordinal scales. It could be far more quantitative, as you say. You can have as much as the data enables you to put behind these things. I've typically looked in other businesses at the complete number of customers and what percentage of the customer base is affected and then had a tiered rating between low, medium, high and very high, depending on which percentage of customers might be impacted because that aligns with um, the risk of impact, but it also aligns with the notification cost for the business. So that's a, that's a good one. Um, and you can have as good as is available to you as other um, risk lenses. This is... This is when an, a subject matter expert gets back involved again after these 15 minute questionnaires have done their job, which is you have delivered to you a lot of the very basic data that you would need to gather to be able to start to make this expert judgment. You will also know who to go back to who knows something about this transfer. You will also know when the contract is due for renewal. 
you will also know which vendors are involved and who the vendor contacts are. Things that you won't have had to spend time finding out about if you get this right. And this is how it joins up. This is, I guess, this probably speaks to some of the questions that have been asked. Right up the top left, you've got that referral piece or identification piece. Um, you've got the key for who. Everybody may well throw a transfer at you via through a, a, either a procurement process or a change initiation process or a, 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 an architecture and strategy forum. You may have something that surfaces something and your first answer is, Great, go and answer the, uh, answer the 15 minute triage questionnaire. Fantastic, thank you. The output of that will then give us an inherent risk estimate, a little indicator of risk. If it's low risk, your stakeholders, because it's quite intuitive, will understand why you've said it's low risk. They'll have signed off on the fact that you defer that stuff by default. If that changes, they can request it goes back into scope. That's fine. You can, you can change that by discretion, you record why. If it's medium, that's when you start to plug a subject matter expert back in. If it's medium, it's either escalated to be something you really kick the tires on along with the high and very high rated ones, or it goes in with a pot of lower risk ones to be deferred, to be done later or to be descoped for a longer period of time. You then do the assessment. If the assessment says that actually we've got no way to make this legal, you decide whether you can tolerate that risk. It goes around the risk management loop that's at the bottom left and around the bottom sorry, bottom right and round the bottom. Um, if you can fix it, if there's something you can do, if you can put in encryption, if you can pseudonymize, if you can add um, contractual controls that demand that your third party challenges if they're asked to submit data to law enforcement in a particular way, if, if you have uh, confidence that that is sufficient to mitigate the risk for a given transfer, then you need to track that. You need to keep control of that. You need to have a deadline for it to be done. And if it's not done, it gets sent around the loop again to say, well, do you know, blockage is a risk too. But there are some rules. You can't make this work if you're asking things that only a specialist can answer at the start. You really don't ask any questions unless they're driving a planning decision or driving a prioritization decision. The questions have to be simple. It has to be pleasurable to answer. That sounds silly. I've worked with people who've gone, do you know what? They just have to ask these questions. It's my job, it's their job, they just have to get it done. That doesn't mean they do. <laughs> we, need to, we need to get in touch with our marketing and our UX people, our, our user experience people and get them to design stuff that people are keen to do. And survey, surveys are a good way to do that. People like that. Second, a couple of turns for the handle and people come back and say, do you know what? That isn't bad. And the Delta, the next time around, the next year, if you have to check it again, it's five minutes because not much has changed. And they're also, by that time, they're pretty familiar with what your levers for risk are. They start to understand, they start to get that feel for what's risky, what they need to talk to you about. And they're more willing to talk to you because you're not firing them a spreadsheet with 300 questions. But, you know, these things feed into awareness. And the risk appetite for stakeholders, the stakeholders understand why you're prioritizing and on basis on which you're triaging and why things are left out of scope then you can have a conversation with them about an overall view of where you are. This may be a front sheet for a status update where you're demonstrating that you have um, this amount of transfers with this exposure at this stage in their um, assessment, identification, remediation. This can all be fed out of the information that I'm talking about gathering with the workflow that you can, you can put in behind the scenes for this. Um, so this is really where we're aiming for. And this is how the picture changes of what you can actually understand, what you can tell a story about. What we're talking about is, if you remember, making space for the obvious things that we're going to be doing by default. The biggest bits of processing, our IT offshore partner, our IT service partner, our platform as a service partner, we're going to be doing those things anyway. Those are a total given, you should plug them into the system too, just so you can compare, compare apples to apples for everybody. But you, you're going to be well underway assessing transfers for those anyway. This is about describing the rest of your world because you can bet your bottom dollar if something goes bang, it's going to be some minor thing that somebody's paid for on a credit card that's going on in the background that you didn't manage to understand and didn't manage to get across and didn't manage to assess in that unidentified portion. 
Now, the trick with this is the accountability piece I, I was gonna talk about in a very quickly now, because it's not just about what you can assess, it's about getting the business to understand that there's only so much you can do and getting the business to understand they are accepting the risk of the time it takes to get across this. Or they have to give you more people. That's the conversation that we're aiming to have. This is my introduction to accountability. This is, this is where my career was in 2012 and it hasn't moved a great deal of distance since. And until we start having the right conversations. So I occasionally start drawing with my pencils when I get frustrated with, with the world. And this is really representing what we've just been discussing. You've got a whole bunch of stuff in a change program. You don't really know how risky it is. It's all linked to each other. There's maybe a vendor in there, a transfer in there, as well as a piece of change that you're doing with a different one platform or another. And you try to engage with everything before it hits that project initiation point. Um, and then you kind of end up here. Uh, it's, it's, if you haven't got the right accountability and you're not plugged in in the right way and the prioritization isn't recognized, then you're just gonna be chasing on behind. Um, obviously this is more a waterfall view of the world, but there's also an agile view of the world as well. Um, but these, these can, things can be um, made more efficient. I look like I've got a five o'clock shadow there, I think, because I don't think I rubbed out some pencil very well on my face or, or the face there. Um, but everybody has to be involved. There's no two ways about it, especially in a big business, big business. In a small business, getting across this and keeping this record looks like quite a mature way of doing things with very little effort. But in a big business, it is effort. You need to get buy-in to get it done with that risk management catch 22. And, and this is really the crux of it. We have the remediation risk that you were talking about. How much risk to data subjects? How much risk to the business if there's a breach and there's notification costs, or you have data damage that's IP, or you have operations that are impacted, um, or you just find out down the road, perhaps with AI or machine learning, that you're doing a whole bunch of harm, even though it's beautifully secure, secure and doing exactly what you intended it to do, um, which is something I think we tend to forget. Um, but the other side of this is engagement risk. It's the fact that unless we've got the right amount of people and the right amount of time and the right amount of support and the right amount of tools to do the job, then the risk persists and risk takes longer to fix. Because, you know, why do we bother with accountability? It never goes wrong. Nothing, nothing ever impacts us if we don't bother to land accountability where it needs to go. And this is another key thing, if we haven't driven out where we need help, if we haven't driven out the tasks that belong to each of the stakeholders in this game, then we have no basis upon which to have the conversation about the support we need. Um, it's a positive to escalate if you've identified the right people. And the only way you identify the right people is to do a pretty detailed racy as a background piece of work for this. And it doesn't matter which executive board member you think is accountable, as long as somebody is as long as somebody understands that they are the ultimate escalation point. And, and this is what I consider a racy, something as granular as this, in terms of which stakeholders need to be involved and which part they play in this. Um, nobody should be accountable for something that they can't influence or don't understand. So we as specialists are responsible for equipping people with the knowledge to be able to make good risk decisions. And a lot of the numbers that we're throwing at them in terms of dollars and percentage probabilities aren't actually giving them that. It's giving them a, um, a mistaken view of either security or insecurity or exposure or lack of exposure based on what they understand of financial risk world. Um, and I don't think we and many people are mature enough to convince anybody that that bears a provable relationship to what's going on operationally much of the time. It's probably far more honest and useful to have a conversation where you talk about how many data subjects are at risk because of a particular kind of breach as opposed to trying to just put numbers on it. And really, I think this is at the crux of things. Um, we are driven with trends, obviously, by some hard lines of compliance. But when a regulator says, I'm sorry, you just must do this, it's never the end of the story. There's always a conversation about 
whether or not you can magic up control or immediately cease processing. And what they're looking for is a risk-based conversation. They're looking for evidence that you have in good faith understood your risk profile and understood your processing risks and taken steps towards managing them. And focusing all our attention on what we think is most important and ignoring the rest of the at-risk transfer population or the at-risk change project population or vendor population or at-risk list or list of vulnerabilities is not going to answer that question effectively. And this is just a reflection of more traditional risk indicators if say I was doing vendor governance or change assurance, it's the absolutes and the uh, conditional ones. Um, and in context of vulnerability management, we would tend to look to CDSS and I mean CDSS tries to do exactly what I'm talking about. CDSS has environmental metrics where it's asking about confidentiality, integrity, availability. It's looking for the local risk perspective. We often don't fill that in. This is what I'm talking about doing is filling that in. It's filling in that lens of your, your local assets and, and their associated risk indicators. And when you talked about science behind it, this is some of the stuff. This is, this is one of the things that is there. It's a company called Vivo Security. Uh, they found this reasonable line of fit by looking at all the SEC and HIPAA filings for about four or five years. And um, reliably, the amount of employees correlated pretty strongly to, to the amount of breaches. Um, now, that's pretty intuitive. If data passes through more hands, we're going to have more go wrong. But we haven't had data to go with that today. Now, now we've got something and there are other things out there as well. So build that in. Justify the thresholds you're putting on what's more risky versus something else, the weightings and the thresholds. Refine those, tune those. Do through this process. Add that science behind the scenes. And also plug it in when you're looking at vulnerabilities at the other end. I mean, we have, we've, we have conversations. We've got 750 control gaps, or we've got 780 vulnerabilities. And then we start having a conversation saying, oh, but do you know what? 80% of those aren't so bad because they're for systems that aren't connected to very much and they haven't got a throughput of any personal data and the availability requirements, they're not five lines availability, so they, we don't, we're not really worried about them. That sounds like an excuse after the fact. Or we're saying that's not a really a, that's not a vendor we really worry about because they're not doing, you know, a lot of stuff and they're not doing it in a risky country. If you do the triage step, if you do the upfront work. You've got all that context and most of those vulnerabilities would have been in a risk tolerance within a risk tolerance threshold already and you would have been ahead of the game because the stakeholders who understood your risk criteria your risk indicators would know exactly the language you were speaking when you go to them and say we're going to defer remediation for some of these we're going to leave it till the next release or we're going to tolerate this more permanently once you've done a, a controls or test or a bit of research or a bit of bug bounty work. And this is something else you can achieve as well. If you have got a rating of transfers or vendors or whatever by these risk indicators, these aggregate risk indicators, there's a pretty reliable correlation to how much effort it takes. How many hours in the day does it take to go out and do the tire kicking? If it doesn't, you, you steal estimates from the big four consultancies you've asked to come and pitch to you for doing the in-depth assessments and you take those hours estimates for how much effort it takes to do the assessments. Um, and you also, you know what it takes to, to run a service, to run a team. So you add the overheads and then you times the um, per entity, per transfer, per vendor, per change project um, assessment. And um, if you haven't got enough people, then there's options to flex. I'm going to take longer to do this amount, or I do less. Or the department who's got all the bright ideas and is signing up all the new vendors puts some money in the pot to bring a consultant on board for the peak of demand. And it can also be plugged into working out how frequently you kick the tires thereafter, justifying not doing an assessment every year, justifying just doing the triage to see if the risk profile has changed. How often do you look check? and see whether you should reassess the risk you accepted. All that can be tied in as well. And that is quite a lot. That's my everything I had intended to talk about. Um, and now I, you know, have at me, tell me why. 
<laughs> Boy, I'm wrong. <laughs> Firstly, thank you for this. Uh, Carrie had some comments, so maybe, Carrie, would you like to start the discussion? Uh, sure, why not? Um, so Pick up on camera if you want. If oh, yeah. No, this is right. I forget about these things. Uh, can you see me? Maybe no. not. No. Oh, wait, I have to turn the other thing on. I have to do it in a two way thing. Otherwise, it doesn't actually work. Um, so I loved it, Sarah. This was a really good talk. And a lot of this is stuff we've, we've talked about before. I know she and I hashed things out earlier. The, the thing that I I kind of was a little struck on is a few slides back. You wanted to make this simple and, and kind of quick, uh, like 15 minutes, I think, or have a little yeah. bit of questions. I mean, just I want to make sure I understand. Are you actually suggesting that we need to consolidate this down to like 15 questions or is it more or 15 minutes worth of questions or is it more like being um, targeted with the questions that we ask to different stakeholders because I don't well why don't you tell me first and then I can sure so no I I get exactly where you're coming from 15 minutes is a little bit like a USP it's a little bit of a of a marketing blurb uh, for, for a woman who doesn't really do marketing, but that it's one of the hooks it hangs from. Um, because it's less than that if no somebody doesn't hit the killer questions, the gating questions. Right. Um, like if they're if they're not if they're doing EU data, we're going to ask them a shed load of other questions, most of the other questions. <laughs> um, if they're high availability, we're going to ask them a fair amount of questions. Um, but if they're not doing sensitive data, then it's going to branch away and go to the next set of questions versus asking them some stuff about the sensitive data. So it is, it can be probably up to half an hour worth of answering questions, but only if it's triggered by the upstream risk indicator. It's so a, if they, it's a tiering yeah. process and you, you have a waterfall of like, you know, follow up questions. Bending yeah. Up. I guess what I'm, mine is more a, when, I, when I've seen some of these approaches, so I come at it a little bit from the vendor management space um, because I've done a lot of vendor risk assessments and there's a lot of this. And in fact, I pointed out in the comments, this is sort of like, a, it would be nice to have something like the SIG or the SIG light, you know, for, for the uh, data assessments, you know, or for these kinds of assessments under SHREMS because that there is a it's a it's an updated body by share, shared assessments group they they make sure that the questions comport to kind of uh, topical relevant privacy and and information security questions and you know having something like that and i think one trust is probably trying something and a few of the other big brands are probably trying something like this i think that approach is a is a is a good way to start but even they recognize you need to break this up to different stakeholders because you're not going to get a full picture if you just blast 15 questions to say um, IT. Yeah, I, I've seen this in, in practice all the time. You ask one guy and the one guy thinks, no, we don't, we're not doing any personal data whatsoever. We're not sharing anything. And it's because he only sees the back end of the elephant. He doesn't see the front end of the elephant like this, a legal or or the program manager or project manager might, you know what I mean? So like, is, do you have those kinds of, um, when, you're, when you're pushing this, when you're promoting this, do you have that understanding built in to how you- Yeah, yeah, definitely. And what, a couple of the things, a couple of sort of people-centric things are um, in asking the first set of questions, um, there would have been awareness activity done. I would have worked out who my target audiences are there would be a pool of people in procurement, in legal, in supplier relationship management, in IT vendor management, in business system ownership kind of world. Um, and those guys will all have had the FAQs and they'll have understood what, we, what we're getting at and why. Mm. They, they would have all gone through this in the session. They would have gone through a questionnaire in the session and asked all the questions in the session to get to get it off their off their. Um, uh, to, to get it out of their heads and then it would be um, integrated as feedback or we'd update the FAQs. But more to the point, um, we make it very, very clear that the person answering it isn't the person who's gonna be nailed with the need to do the next assessment step. Or we're, ju we're just asking whoever it's pointed at 
and it's always the person who engages the vendor who's, who's, who's ever the prime contact um through procurement because they're the people who should be accountable for these this being a gating activity and it we get it plugged in as a gating activity a mandatory one um then those people whoever knows most about it answers it but they're not on the hook necessarily for the next assessment they can tell us who should be mm. um and once we've got that baseline it tends to get easier i guess i'm still just trying to wrap my head around like the um if you ask let's say this per bleh, i can speak i swear the procurement team is, is a good example here you know they they might be responsible for you know ushering in the process of procurement you know at the at the final end but where they often aren't aware of the interesting technical and or data protection challenges so they may not be able to truthfully answer that question reliably but remember that this is the this is the trick this is the absolute trick if you can't get somebody who is at earlier stages of the procurement and selection process or who has been left tasked with looking after that supplier relationship, if they can't answer it, they either should be able to answer it and they need to have an uplift in their education. So that's a gap, that's an engagement risk that you log, that you don't have any suitably knowledgeable people who are looking after the supplier relationship because some may have got, haven't got the first clue about even basics of the data. So that's that's a risk in itself. But second, but primarily what you're doing is you're only asking questions that it is reasonable to know and knowable at the earliest stages. Now, that sounds like a ridiculously small and generalist subset, but it's a powerful subset when you can aggregate it and you get some reasonably reliable risk indicators linked to it in the back end. We're not trying to ask technical questions and the trick is actually phrasing the questions so they're not technical. So I guess we need to um, make procurement as our champions in this so that we train them. Train the training, and, yeah. Yeah, and they become like your control function during these tiering, not just for privacy, for your security and that they, they should have a, have a form they need to go through to understand the risk and then they become your like risk managers for when there is. Yeah, I, I think I think the problem with this is that um, that sweet spot is really, really hard to find. And it is business and context dependent in a lot of cases. But we have to keep circling back to the fact that nobody should be spending money on a service or a supplier if they can't answer the kind of questions we need answered. That doesn't magic up the knowledge to be able to answer it but it does drive out a risk you need to mitigate in the business sorry um any other questions because i'm i can hold forth on this forever yes, sir, I, had a, I had a couple of questions um actually i think it's on the slide before right that you had there um <laughs> the the thing i really like about it no, sorry, a couple of more. Go back a couple of slides. Um, one more, da, 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 more. Keep going, keep going. One more. Yeah, this one. So, Go back. Uh, yeah, so I, I, the thing that I really struck to me, was, which I, I, I know I have this conversation several times, is, is exactly that idea that we, we have to simplify the questions that we ask to the teams, right? You know, like we, we always end up with these gigantic shopping list of questions, right? And, and most of them don't take into account the previous questions. So either they get very repeated, they get very redundant. And, and it's kind of like, I think Dida mentioned, should we be asking 15 questions to developers? And there's almost a question of, actually, yes, right? You know, like if you can create a series of questions, a series of paths that by answering those questions, you get enough context to figure out all the other things that we do, we are pushing a huge overhead, right? To a lot of people, right? So, yeah. so, so when I saw this, basically, you know, for me, I see a graph, right? It's a decision tree, right? It's basically a, a sequence of events. And I guess, how far have you explored this, right? Yeah, I mean, because I have, it, yeah. I've run this in practice with sets of, with question sets to make sure that they're all branched logically so that you don't have any gaps that you fall through where you don't answer a question you should answer. Um, 
you don't miss cool. that question, you should answer. Um, and some of them are, and actually funny enough, learning about AI has helped me with this. <laughs> because there's, yeah. a, there's a lot of data science in what exactly. I've just been yeah. trying to do. So part of the reason why this works, and it's, it works deceptively well, is the concept of weak signals in yeah. intelligence, that you have indicators of risk that surface quite early in a process or quite early in defining characteristics of processing or a system or whatever, mm -hmm. that, that if you track those as a risk indicator through and use those to tune the priority to look at things, that actually works quite well. It, you, that, it becomes an entity that is requiring more scrutiny throughout its lifetime quite reliably. And uh, what I was shocked about with the question sets that I've driven in and had work and had aggregate data out at the end of is how consistently the split is between a very high, high, medium and low population. The percentages that were falling into those pots were quite consistent. And also trying to drive a mop up through accounts payable for vendors. Um, I put three killer questions in, is it data risk? Is it physical risk? Is it, you know, are they coming on our site? Are they needing remote access? Um, data risk, physical risk and availability. Yeah. And when everything that answered what yes to one of those things, we'd already picked it up. Yeah. Yeah. So if I had 30, out of 13 months of trying to mop up through accounts payable and then sampling in out of scope populations, it's very little we had, we'd that had fallen through the net as a false negative. So, I, I mean, people say, well, why are these the right indicators? Why are these the right questions? Well, they're the right questions because stuff that we need to assess isn't falling out of scope. We, we, we're, we're expertise, we, we're begging, we beg people because we don't have hard lines that are given to us, like how much data is high risk. People don't give us that stuff. So we estimate. We are always trying to defend our expertise. This evidences it because if someone doesn't like it and they think more should be in scope, move the slider. And then but you're then going to have to give us three more full time people to assess what goes into scope then. So then yeah. we have a conversation about your risk appetite. In terms of, OK, you said you captured this. So what were you using? Was it the spreadsheet? What were you actually using to, uh, was it a Jupyter notebook? It's, what were you it's, using spreadsheets for... to, it, it's spreadsheets in the back end to chuck out the risk indicators. But then I built mm -hmm. it in SharePoint and SharePoint did the weightings as well. I'm mm -hmm. trying to build it in a couple of other survey tools at the moment just to make it a bit more portable. Um, but it's it. Uh, none of the none of the governance systems are quite configurable enough to do the job. It's actually it needs more quality on the survey front and the back end yeah. calculations front to actually make it work. Well, and I, I think there's also an element that there's a moment where you need to start customizing this to the company, right? Because the bottom line is like the more you make it relevant to the business, the more you make it relevant to the language that they have, right? The more it makes sense and the more they, you know, I really like the idea of weak signals because you can actually be asking questions that almost are business questions, you know, like how does, what you're doing and how everything fits together. But, you know, behind the scenes, you actually start to connect or figure out a lot of signals on going, well, this is going to have a lot of problem or, you know, this is going to have a lot of risk that uh, you're coming, you know, in the future. So, so we, we need to, you know, build this. Can you open source and, and release under your stuff under Creative Commons so we can continue, right? Because yeah, do you know, I'm talking, I'm talking about a couple of people who, um, who can maybe get, I just to, to get to a proof of concept. I tried working with, with people who, who were used to sort of surveys in an education context, but they didn't get where I was coming from with some of the other layers of it. Um, so I've never, I haven't got as far as I wanted with it. But. Yeah, what, what, what you want, what, what you kind of want is, is decision trees, right? You know, it's yeah. almost like this, this waiting where, you know, it's like you're saying here, you, you keep asking questions and then the more, the more questions you ask, the more you come up with an information of, on, on a sense of what is the risk, what is, what, what's going on. You almost, you pick up the clues based on the questions and the way they answer the questions, right? Yeah, and, but there's uh, also always a human in the mix initially because that, yeah, of course. but it's your UAT testing, isn't it? You, yeah, of course. You, you have, you it's only ever provisional for the first couple of turns for handle until you find out how reliable it is and you've tuned it. Um, yeah. and, and you're always massively responsive to users with questions because users cease to trust it and won't do it again unless they can get mm -hmm. through to someone who can help them understand yeah. why it's not what they expected. And that yeah. feedback is gold dust as well for tuning. Yeah. So I, th I think what would be good here is to, to try to pick up even simple use cases because the, the pattern that you're describing is a pattern of we need to get, an, you know, we need to measure the maturity model of something. Right? We need to measure something. We need to understand, you know, in a way, why are you why are you measuring risk? Because you need to know 
am I going to accept it? Do I need to do something about it? Right. So it's almost like there's a decision at the end I need to arrive. Mm. And and but these are this is very applicable to all sorts of things, right? Risk just happens to be a great one because you know there's you know already a big problem which is we do generate hundreds or thousands of questions that clearly don't scale, right? Mm. Uh, when the reality is that you, you should be able to answer, you know, five or six or ten questions and then reverse engineer the rest, or then know what are the next five or ten questions that That's it. are relevant. Well, the, what this does is well, yeah, exactly as you're saying, what this yeah. has done historically, I've got another slide I haven't shown because I didn't think I could get away with showing it. It's a bit, um, it's a bit proprietary. Um, for somebody else. <laughs> so it's um because I, I designed it, but um it, it shows how a few questions do a lot of heavy lifting. A few questions give you a fairly reliable persistent yeah. indicator of inherent risk that carries through the full life cycle of whatever the thing that might have gaps is. Mm -hmm. But also um if you we've embedded questions that are going to um, pre-triage your subsequent um, vulnerability scoping, test scoping, or your yes. controls assessments scoping, yes. because um, you have standardized responses you can pass to wipe things, wipe the whole question sets out. Yes. And you and not not least, not least, you can lift all the housekeeping questions across yes. to the next part, because people don't do that. And that's why you build um, uh, hierarchical things in JIRA to do this stuff because you don't want to have to put the same information in twice. Yeah. Yeah, but, but I think that's how security scales, right? Yeah. We we scale literally by, you know, that imagine that massive tree that and as you answer questions, things start to disappear, things start to get more prominence, things start to get bigger weights and smaller weights. And the reality is that you know we can we also use real world data, right? So then we can have post incidents. You can go back and say, well, what do we miss? What question should I have asked at what moment in time yeah. to do that? And then you know, okay, this is now should be there. Yeah, you no, want to put I, this I, I, tranche of things in scope more right, more quickly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah. Do, do all that. I mean, now, what, the other thing is, is you've got um, if if this goes, this is a bit like security labels. If if this delta view goes along almost like a passport through from earliest initiation, because that's when you can gather it if you get it right through dev and then through change, you can attach that kind of passport level information for that entity to it and you leverage it through the SOC later as yeah. well. So actually, if you think about it, the security labels are almost your top level questions, right? Or one of the outcomes of a lot of this, or basically, you know, the stuff that you want to answer because that gives a lot of weight to some of the stuff that's happening here. Yeah. Well, yeah. Oh, this gives credit. This gives the next layer down to security labels. It's, it's, it's privacy it's, labels. Privacy labels. It's a feedback. <laughs> privacy labels. Yeah. Now, this is brilliant. Yeah, we definitely have to have another session just on that. So that... <laughs> but yeah, I, Carrie's point is very, very pertinent. There, there's a sweet spot with things that make sense and language that makes sense for people to reuse. Because I think if you just give something that's flat with gaps for them to fill in to configure it from the ground up, they won't do it, or it's too daunting, or it's not adding value. Yeah. There's a lot of this which is transferable almost universally, and then you educate on what tweaking means, what what is the output, what is the effect of tweaking on it. Um, but you can provide the wraparound FAQs and educational stuff with it. What we're trying to get across is the intent, I guess, is what are we yes. intending to do here? Yeah. And and actually if you if you ask people intent, they lie. <laughs> So if you break it down and ask them what they're doing stuff with, who they're doing it with, and ask them to add a little bit of upfront pre free form as a tiebreaker, you can then you can then do a little bit of double checking back about whether they what they said they were planning to do gels with what they've told you in the questions. And I don't know whether you can program to filter for that, but we'll see. Especially for uh, vendors that are already in use it's really really hard what if you find something your actions are it can be quite daunting yeah i mean it, i the first time i implemented this the thing i designed this to do was to triage a 2000 strong supplier population in a financial services firm and the descoping was brutal initially because what we said was um we justified there was a logical justification for everything that was descoped by default before we started triaging 
um, because we said, look, we'll, we will roll back and triage more in the next pass, but we are defining what we're discoping and why. So we, and we got sign off on all that. Mm -hmm. Once we evidenced the value in the triage, there was more budget for more people to go back and do more and also more budget to kick tires on the things that they then felt confident were a priority. Um, the resource model sheet I showed you goes with a spreadsheet where I have a task breakdown by hours and role definitions for all of those activities um, and percentage time allocated to each task for each employee so I know how um, wow. my full-time yeah. count changes depending on population change. And are these privacy specialists or are they security specialists who are also doing? It's privacy? whoever, it's, it's who, who, which warm bodies you have and which skills they have and how much of their time they can dedicate to each of those tasks. So you may have one person that dedicates 40, 30, 30% to three of the different tasks that are uh, two of which are overheads and one of which scales with the amount of suppliers. Um, you may have someone else that's 100% on supplier assessments um, because that's their skill set. Um, and if you take a person out of the mix or you put suppliers into the mix, and depending on how risky the suppliers are, it then adjusts your resource availability view. But I'm, I'm currently actually working on what specific risk indicators we might be able to pull out for AI that you can surface at these early stages. Um, and that's really fascinating because I'm try I'm been challenged to break it down by indicators that are useful to know at different stages in the AI supply chain. So in defining and accumulating the test data set, the training data set in training, in, in model design, in model implementation, um, in just using the model in a system. So that's the kind of stuff I'm working on behind the scenes. Interesting. It's really interesting. So what would be the next steps for this? Is this going to become a project, do you think, um, that you are willing to open source, as Dennis was saying? I think so. I mean, I, I've got... Um, the thing that I'm really, really interested in is to understand what people consider other potential risk indicators that might meet this criteria for being knowable at the earlier stages and things that we can attach to binary answers or multiple choice answers or tiered answers for some kind of um, speculative threshold that we can tune later. Um, it, it's respecting the fact that this breaks as soon as you need a technical person or a supplier to answer it because the lead time to get the answers wipes out the utility of trying to get them early. Um, uh, the problem I'm trying to solve here is 100% being told to go away until designs are finalized, at which point there's no point. Mm. Would one KRI be like um, unassessed vendors which are in high risk category or something like that? Absolutely. Yeah, there, there, there's a slide that was in here where I have my uh, management feedback was split between engagement KRIs and remediation KRIs and my engagement KRIs. Um, my threshold was, yeah, it was um, numbers. It was percentage of suppliers, um, high risk and very high risk suppliers that were assessed by targets. So we set target dates and we had a um, we had tracking against a flight path for expected numbers of assessments by date. Percentages made sense because the supplier population changed quite wildly in the initial phases. So if you started, uh, if you started being judged by numbers, it, it started being a false representation of, of, of efficiency. Um, and yeah, remediation KRIs was um, because we we used the inherent risk indicators to um, adjust the residual risk findings for vendors. So example of that is if you've got an access control for a very tiny vendor dealing with not much data, 
that broken access control is not going to be as much risk as for a large vendor that's dealing with lots of sub vendors and lots of data. Um, whereas on a pure war of attrition type controls assessment audit world, one deficiency in access management would get counted very much the same as another deficiency in access management. This, this is a way of front ending or pre accepting that if you've got a low inherent risk supplier, you cannot feasibly have a high inherent risk control failing. Yeah. Unless there's a trend across lots of suppliers where perhaps you find out maybe your control requirements are broken because you shouldn't be asking for it for them. Um, or and other feedback in, that's useful to have. Cool. Questions from the audience? Comments from the audience? Cool. Don't be shy. If you have any more questions, we'll be here for another couple of minutes. Um, and I have um, shared Sarah's LinkedIn profile in the chat window. If you want to go follow her and um, she's also very active on Twitter. I do suggest you follow her. Her posts are really um, informative. Um, yeah. Thank you all for joining us and thank you, Sarah, for sharing with us. You're more than welcome. I, uh, I'll never turn up a, an opportunity to geek out about risk, but if there's any thoughts afterwards, do touch base via one of those places. Thank you.